listen, you guys live in God's country. I hope you know you live in God's country. I live in Boxburg, which is less God's country. <laughs> Actually, live in Benoni. And if you know anything about Joburg, Benoni and Boxburg, Oaks don't dig it when you tell them you're from Boxburg when you're actually from Benoni. And likewise, there's big competition between the two. It's a little bit like the bulls and the lions, you know, the Yuxke River separates. And uh, so it's really good to be with you guys today. I want, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Pastor Zane and take a moment to honor him. It's important that we honor our leaders. And uh, if you look at what God has done in him and Erica's life and through their lives over the 28 odd years, he arrived here in the dawn of democracy in our nation. Isn't that amazing? And so thank you for your leadership and for the invitation to be with you. I love talking to men because I think men actually, at the end of the day, uh, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything in our society and in our culture rises and falls on the quality of the, the man that leads the home, that heads the home, that le leads in church. And uh, I'm a firm, firm, firm believer in... Um, Mutuality, in other words, that God designed men and women both to lead, both to play pivotal roles in society. Uh, it's just that we're wired so different, and culture needs strong women, but it also needs strong men. And uh, we can't do without either or. We need both. And so today, I, I just want to offer you, and I hope to offer you something that will be useful for your life, your leadership in your life, wherever you lead, however you lead, whatever your leadership context looks like. I do pray that um, the Lord will deposit something into your life today. So with that, can I ask us, I know you've just sat, but can we stand and just honor God's word as we read it? And, uh, and then we'll get into it this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Father, in these moments, we pray as men. We come together and we pray. Uh, not out of a sense of ritual, not out of a sense of um, obligation. Lord, we come tonight and we pray because... You've called us to pray because you opened access to you, Father. And so this morning we remind ourselves that we have access to a God in heaven who loves us. We have access to the God who formed us from the dust of the earth, breathed his life into us. And that you are for us, not against us. And that, as we've read already, and that you are for men. And we pray, therefore, for your touch upon this time together. We haven't come just to eat bacon. But we've come, Lord, to hear you, and we've come to connect with you, and we've come to ask you to speak something into our lives. And just as you breathed into Adam, we know that we come to life when you breathe into us. And so we ask today, this morning, would you breathe your spirit into us? Would you, would you put a word of life into us? Would you renew our faith? Would you strengthen our faith? Would you stretch us? Would you challenge us? Would you mold us? Would you shape us, Jesus, into more of you? Would you renew our thinking? Would you renew our minds? Would you help us to see the world differently today? In Jesus' name. And everybody who is a man in this place, who is looking forward to bacon, but wanted God to do something in their life as well, said? Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Have a seat. Uh, the title of the, the, the message today is Becoming a Man Who Changes the Game. Becoming a Man Who Changes the Game. I think it will be fair to say if you and I, if we look over the entire uh, course of history, um, individuals have always changed society and changed culture. Notice that individuals have had a profound effect on culture, and we can look at the, 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 the dodgy end of the spectrum. You can look at Vladimir Putin at the moment and what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. You can look at Adolf Hitler, or you could look at Mahatma Gandhi. You could look at Mother Teresa. You could look at Winston Churchill. Uh, but most of all, we look at Jesus. And the, the point is, and, and this is something I, I, I pray you'll grasp this morning, God has always worked through individuals and God has always worked in and through men. And I think what we've got to be careful of in our culture today is buying into the fact that, that uh, the collective is more powerful than the individual. The collective certainly matters, but it, God has always started moments in history not through the collective, but through an individual. 
God's always given a vision, a, a burden, a, a desire to change culture to individuals. And while you and I may not start necessarily a movement that changes the entire course of history, what we can do and what we can receive is a burden from God for our families, for our work context, for our church, for the people we lead. And we can change that environment. We can change that game. Are you with me? Uh, a couple of years ago, 10 odd years ago, I had the privilege of being in New Zealand, and the taxi driver that picked us up in Auckland, as soon as he heard the accent, he knew we were South African. And this guy wanted to talk about two things. He wanted to talk about rugby, and he wanted to talk about sheep. So in New Zealand, it's really, really important, the sheep to person ratio. I didn't know this, but they want, they, they, in their country, they want to have at least 10 sheep to every human being. So 4 million people, 40 million sheep. That's kind of the ratio that they're comfortable. So this guy was teaching me all about the sheep to person ratio in New Zealand. It's a vital part of the economy. And then he gets onto the rugby side of things and he, he listens to the accent. He says, oh, you're South African. He says, can we talk rugby? I said, absolutely. Uh, he says, can I talk to you about Skulk Burger and Richie McCaw? So I'm like, let's, let's, let's talk about it. And, and listen, this guy was in awe of Skulk. I want to give this New Zealand taxi driver credit. He, he knew his rugby. He knew Skulk was quality. And then he started to talk a bit about Richie McCaw. And of course, subsequent to that, Richie McCaw retired. Um, but listen to Richie McCaw's st stats. Uh, he was a game changer to the point of the message. Test debut in 2001, 148 test caps. Captain of the first team in history to win World, two World Cups back to back. 135 test points, which for a flank is unbelievable. And 27 tries, uh, widely regarded as the best open side flanker the world has ever known. Uh, Richie was a game changer. He, he changed open side flanking in, in rugby. Uh, as South Africans, we didn't like him because he was on the ground. He was as foul as anything, as dirty a player as you could ever hope to happen on the ground. But he always changed the game for his team, didn't he? And so this New Zealand taxi driver was talking to me about Skullberger and Richie McCaw, and I'll never forget his words. He, he said, both are game changers. Today, let's talk a little bit about being a game changer, a man who changes the game. A game changer, when they arrive on the field, everything shifts. So the, the whole course of the game actually alters itself, doesn't it? Uh, we've got, we talk about impact players in sport. Uh, the whole dynamic of what goes on in the field shifts. Maybe I could say it this way. The atmosphere in the two teams shift when a game-changing player arrives on the scene. What do I mean? Um, the opposing team definitely knows this person's on the field. And, and the team for whom the game-changer plays begins to, their, their morale lifts. Their, 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 lives start, <laughs> their lives on the field start to get better. Being a game changer, I think God has called men. The, the call has never changed. Uh, Adam and Eve created, what does God say? He says, I want, you to, I want you to subdue the earth. I want you to rule lovingly over it. I, I want you to name creatures. I want you to tend the earth. I want you to look after it. I want you to steward what you've been given and stewarded well. The, the call has never changed. We've always been called to be loving, careful stewards of what God has given us. And where necessary, where evil abounds, where difficulty uh, abounds, where tragedy is in, uh, happens, is to change the game. To be a person who changes the atmosphere of the, of the circle that's around us. Are you with me? Each of us carry a vibe. Each of us carry an atmosphere. Our worlds, our families, our workplaces, our work colleagues, our, our branches, our divisions, our businesses, they all carry an atmosphere. And I guess the question I want to ask you is, what's the atmosphere change like when you and I step into that field? Scripturally, there's a great example of a game changer. It's the story of uh, young David at this stage, uh, who would later go on to become King David. It's the well-known historical account of David and Goliath. I want, I want to uh, read a fair chunk of Scripture this morning, and I, I, the reason I do so is so that you can get a sense for the game-changing atmospheric e effect he had on a difficult situation for his nation. How many of you would agree that our nation is in a difficult space at the moment? 
David's nation, nation of Israel, was in a very difficult space. He arrives on the scene and he lives in this call of God to change the game. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel, Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, and we'll read from verse 32. So don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. So David's speaking to King Saul, who was king over the nation at the time. He says, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, and when a a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Sounds like a nightclub in Joburg. (laughs) (laughs) If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the... Okay, I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do this to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. Do you notice how the atmosphere, can you imagine how the atmosphere in the room starts to shift from David's words? Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor. It was a bronze helmet and a coat of mail, like this thick kind of steel coat. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream, put them into his shepherd's bag, and then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Notice how Goliath doesn't even get a name here just gets called the Philistine the whole time. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And today the Lord will conquer you, and I will, cut off your, you, I will kill you and cut off your head. Then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. It's like a scene from Gladiator, isn't it? And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. In other words, everyone will know that there's an atmosphere change. The game has been changed, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David ran quickly out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and David and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Five characteristics from this account in scripture of a game changer. Number one, David saw differently. In Goliath, Israel's army saw this giant. They saw a mountain that simply could not, they saw an obstacle that could not be overcome. Um, But David, what did he see? An uncircumcised Philistine. Notice David doesn't see, uh, this is so important guys to know, David doesn't see Goliath's physical attributes, he sees his spiritual attribute. So important that we see with spiritual eyes. Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Everyone else sees a giant as an immovable mountain, Game-changing men see those sorts of things as opportunities, as problems to be solved. Uh, My older brother, he's uh, four years older than me, just short of his 40th birthday, he got diagnosed with a disease called multiple sclerosis, MS. Um, By that stage, he had already built two companies and uh, had gone through fantastic times, difficult times. He had built an earth-moving equipment business, and then that had folded. He'd built another business. 
and the stress of it. I mean, nobody's quite sure what causes this disease, but as some of the doctors say the stress of, of the 15-year hard run that he had had from 25 years of age up to 40 years of age left him with, with this disease called MS. And uh, there's two types of uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, fortunately, he has the one that, where you don't lose motor function. So he hasn't lost the use of his hands and his legs, his arms and his legs, but he's got medically boarded. And uh, so he doesn't work anymore, uh, can't work anymore. Um, he's, he's, he's impaired in terms of his function. And the trajectory for that is that in the natural, that, that gets worse unless God intervenes. But over the last few years, he's, he's become uh, one of my heroes, actually, uh, because about a year into it, he, he, he came to me and he said, you know what, I think God is moving things in my life such that, and he was careful not to suggest that the disease came from God, because that would be wrong theology. But he was saying, I think God's working this all out so that I can give myself to his purposes more fully. And so what he, he does is he, he, he just helps to pastor and love people in our church. Like he meets with one on one on one on one on one. Uh, comes in, gives his time, gives his um, look sits on, on um, governing body of schools and uh, on our, our church and just gives his life. And before he had zero time for that stuff. A life-defining, a mountain, a Goliath hits him. And he adjusted it, he reframed his thinking to say, I think this is an opportunity for God to do something in me and to do something through me. Uh, he learned to see differently. What, what's the problem in your life at the moment that could present itself as an opportunity? David looked at Goliath and saw an opportunity to give God glory, not a mountain that couldn't be moved. Game changers. See things differently. I want to say it again. Notice that Goliath, uh, David didn't see Goliath's physical attributes. He saw his spiritual condition. Are you with me, men? All Okay. Number two, David heard differently. So the, the armies hear the taunting verse of, uh, uh, voice of Goliath. They, they, the, all they're hearing is the, the, and we know from Scripture that he would come out day after day after day and kind of taunt the armies of Israel. But David heard differently. What did David hear? David heard the promise and the reassurance of God. Verse 37, the Lord will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. What voice gets loudest in our lives? Listen, the media's got a loud voice in our lives. I think, I think genuinely, and I don't, I don't mean this facetiously, I think genuinely one of the best things that you and I can do is limit our media diet intake. Because uh, remember, the media doesn't um, give news or doesn't create news or doesn't report news, should I say, in order to keep you informed. The media reports news in order to sell their news. And so they've got a very direct in, uh, uh, reason for giving us bad news. Uh, we got, you stand around the braai and there's another person who's talking about immigrating. There's another guy moaning about the economic situation. There's another guy talking about how God has let him down. This is reality. This is life. I'm not suggesting that we remove ourselves from those circles. I'm just asking what's the importance that we give that voice in our lives. Like when it comes to the ranking of voices in our lives, who gets to shout loudest? Who gets, the, 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 who gets to, to be the best or the biggest voice in our lives? And it's so interesting because the armies of Israel, they, they heard Goliath day after day after day. And because they heard him so often, they started to believe him. Can I suggest to you, I feel like this is a word for, for a man here today, just because you've heard something often doesn't make it true. Are you with me? There's a difference between frequency and truth. And in our country, uh, our media likes to report a lot of bad news. Uh, and, and that doesn't change what God has on your life or for your life. 
just because you hear a lot about the fact that the economy is bad, doesn't mean that God can't turn that around for you and for me. Doesn't mean that we, you and I can't live in God's economy. Doesn't mean that you and I can't have a faith that's different to the culture around us. It's not to suggest that things aren't necessary. It's to say, but God said something differently. Notice how David shifts the focus from the voice of Goliath to the voice that, that was in his heart. There's an external voice and an internal voice. The armies of Israel were listening to the external voice. David was listening to the internal voice. And the more you and I know Jesus and the more intimate we are with Jesus, the more oxygen, more breathing room we give his voice. Notice that the external voice was loud and the internal voice is quiet. Notice that the external voice was negative. The internal voice was full of promise, full of reassurance. I think we've got to come aside, men. I think we've got to build ourselves some quiet spaces, some quiet t- space and time in our lives on a daily basis to come aside from the noise, the noise of our families, the noise of our kids, our wives, our colleagues, our, our bosses, our teams. Come aside from literally the noise of everything external and make time to be able to hear, just position ourselves to say, God, could you speak? Could you speak a word of promise and reassurance? You know, yeah, guys, everything changes when we've heard from God. Everything changes. Uh, when Candace fell pregnant with Caitlin, uh, the first scan that we went to go and see, we thought this would be the moment where we'll, we'll uh, announce to everybody that uh, she's pregnant and we're going to have a baby. And it was our first and we were massively excited. Until we went to the scan and the Doctor proceeded with a scan and, and the gynae and he, uh, then he, he said to us, I need you to sit down. And that didn't sound like good news at all. <laughs> Normally they go, here's the scan, off you go, happy days. Uh, and he said to us, I need you to sit down, I've got something to tell you. And he said, when, I look at, when he looks at the scan, the, one of the indicators that they look at is a thing called the nuchal fold. It's, this, it's uh, kind of the, a space in the uh, early development of the child that's kind of near the neck and, and spine. And that nuchal fold, it was uh, significantly enlarged, which is a leading indicator normally of Down syndrome, or he says to us, 26 other diseases that or problems that could be there. And he said, look, I, I'm telling you it doesn't look good. You're going to have to go and see yourself a fetal specialist and just see. And we could only get a fetal specialist appointment in six weeks, six weeks time, six weeks later. For, so for six weeks, we sit with the news that there could be something significantly wrong and Kate, Kate could be disabled uh, in some way. And uh, in that time, I'll never forget sitting in a little, uh, little lounge that we got off the side. I remember sitting on a couch and I remember God, in a quiet, quiet moment, God giving me two distinct verses. And how did he give them to me? Just as I read them. They, it's like they came off the page in 3D. It's like somebody had taken a highlighter. It's like they spoke into my heart so, so clearly. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said, anything's possible for him or her who believes. Matthew 9, 29. Because of your faith, it'll happen. Listen, I lay on my face for six weeks every morning, just marinating in those two words just letting them fill me and letting them come out of me. Sealing God's word in us so that it can then come out of us. So David, David had a promise from God. That's why he could verbalize it. Which voice has been a bit too loud in your life? Which voice has been a bit too frequent in your life? One word from Jesus changes everything. Third characteristic is David thought differently. Here's the thing, guys. The rest of the army were looking for somebody to deliver them. David actually thought he could be that person. Every other guy in that army was going, who's that? Who's it going to be? They were looking for the rock or for... (laughs) Why am I raising this? Their thinking was faulty. Not one of them thought they could take him out. Not one. Not one of them thought that it would be even a remote possibility. 
their thinking was in a place of defeat. See what happens, and this is the problem, it's progressive. The more you and I listen to bad press, the more you and I listen to bad news, the more we listen to an external voice that's negative, eventually we start to believe it. And so goes our, our, our reading diet, goes our thinking, goes the direction of our thinking. Because our lives begin in our thoughts, gents. Our lives, our, our, the very essence of our lives begins in our thinking. The problem with Israel's army was their thinking was defeated before they actually were defeated. David o- 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 McKay said this, your thoughts are the architect of your destiny. He said that again, your thoughts are the architect of your destiny. Huh? Listen, it's, it's easy in our world, eh, guys, it's easy in our world to, to hear the negativity come at us and for us to eventually believe it and then our thinking goes to a place of negativity and a, think, and a place of defeat. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. I want to recommend a resource to you um, by Pastor Craig Rochelle. It's a book called Winning the War in Your Mind. If you haven't had an opportunity to read this book yet, I can highly recommend it to you and I, I can highly suggest it to you. Just uh, the whole thing is on thinking. If there's a takeaway from today, maybe that book could help you. Are you still okay? Number four, David spoke differently. So the army stays paralyzed, intimidated. They, they're just speaking words of fear. Everybody's Got into, everybody's been listening to the wrong stuff. So they're thinking defeat and then they verbalize defeat, right? David spoke words of faith. Notice this. He spoke words of victory, words of faith. He spoke them once to the army, twice to Saul, and once to Goliath himself. Can I suggest to you, gents, that language really, really matters? And uh, the thought came to me as I was preparing for this. The whole nation was hostage to negative language. Negative language holds individuals, men, women, and therefore families, and therefore society, it holds them hostage, holds us hostage. Negative language will hold us hostage, and language leads to actions and feelings and attitudes. So have you ever heard somebody say, hey, how are you going? Oh, well, under the circumstances. Just think for a moment about what a terrible statement that is. Because really what you're saying is, here are the circumstances, here's me, um, and I'm under them. Language matters, it drives everything. Lastly, fifth, David fought differently. So they try and put David's standard issue, or Saul's standard issue armor on him. Uh, David goes, I just want a slingshot and five stones. He fought his own battle, I love it. So He was authentic, he was real. It was, it was, he was the guy... He was being the guy God had created him to be. Hey, he refused to take on someone else's methods. I think there's a, an armor that God is calling men to at this particular point in, in history, particularly just something that I sense. And I think the armor that he's calling us to wear is a level of personal holiness. And what I mean by that is not necessarily some, some old school definition of holiness like drawn aside, never engaging with anybody. I'm not, I'm not talking about being a, nunk, uh, a, a nun or a monk. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about standing as a man who leads family and business and all, all of what we lead. But, but there's a distinction with us. There's a, there's a holiness to us. What's, what's the holiness? Well, we call ourselves aside, but we call ourselves aside in our interior worlds. It's not that we remove ourselves from certain situations, which I think is, is so much of the, of the problem of what's gone wrong is that, that in the past with, uh, with Christianity, Christianity's forgotten the incarnation or in mission in that we are supposed to be the incarnation of Christ within the culture. We're not called us to, uh, to come aside from culture. We're called to be in the culture and yet to be separate within that culture. And the way we do that is through our internal worlds. The way we do that is to understand and realize that we can be holy inside. What do I mean? Well, just these five things. It is to realize that we can speak differently. You know, we can see things differently. We can hear things differently we can 
can let our patterns of thought be different? What, what's the armor, gents, that's going to help you to change the game in your family, in your business, in your church, in your community, in your marriage, in your parenting? What, what's, what's the armor? What's the sling and the five stones? I want to suggest to you it's the holiness of an interior world that's different that sees things differently, hears things differently, thinks differently, and speaks differently. How do we do that? The Apostle Paul told us, Ephesians 3, 16. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from where His glorious, unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit tomorrow's pentecost sunday by the way talking the holy spirit tomorrow in church and then christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him your roots will grow down into god's love and keep you strong and then may you have the power to understand as all god's people should how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is and then i love it check verse 19 then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than what we might ask or think how does it happen through the holiness of a man who comes aside in his interior world and through the power of the spirit of God that breathes into his soul God we see differently, we hear differently, and we think differently, and then we speak differently. And in so doing, the atmosphere, the circles around us change. They become little pieces of ground where there's a burning bush. May he Do that in us and do it through us. Shall we pray? Holy Spirit, fall afresh upon us. Holy Spirit, fill us. Holy Spirit, may we look to you for the life with God that we've always wanted and hoped for. I pray that you'd come and wash over our lives, sweep over our lives. As you do so, bring surrender. We surrender our lives to you. Lord, we surrender our ears and ask you to speak. We surrender our eyes and we ask you to help us see with spiritual eyes. We surrender our minds and ask Spirit of God, come and renew our minds. We surrender our mouths. May we speak life. It'd be my great privilege to pray for you this morning. If, if Jesus is nudging you in this moment to make a decision to follow him. So with men, it's, we just, it's, we don't have to complicate things. My question is very simple and very direct. It's simply this. If you feel God in these moments calling you to follow Jesus, you just feel prompted. You're just like that's up on your radar now, even as we're praying. You know what, God, I I genuinely, I need to start following you, Jesus. 
really practically, truly be my great privilege to pray for you men this morning. I would love the great privilege of, of, of praying just for you and over you. So I'm just going to take a quick moment, do a quick count to three. When I get to three, if that's you, and you'd like me to include you in my prayer, it'll be my honor and privilege. Shoot up your hand. I'll see you. Say thank you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm just going to say thank you, see you, and pray for you. Ready? Hands going up already. That's awesome. On the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Yes, yes, yes. Lots, lots, lots. Yes. Just keep them up, guys, just so I know. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So many. Hey, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, you can take your hands out. Jesus, you're working in our lives right now in these moments. I want to pray a prayer that would offer the truth of your life to these men who have decided to follow you today. Firstly, that you love us immeasurably, uncontainably, infinitely, more than we could ever imagine. I pray firstly that every man here in this space would know that he's loved deeply, authentically, truly loved by the one who breathed life into him. Secondly, Jesus, thank you for your life, that you showed us how to live through the pages of scripture. We see how you lived. We thank you that you you died an atoning death in our place. You, you took the sin that had been handed down to us for generations. You took it upon yourself. You allowed yourself to be bruised, beaten, and killed. So that we didn't. Thank you for that. Thank you that that means... Not only do we have a past that is forgiven, and we can ask you in this moment now, those of you who responded, just ask the Lord to forgive and wash clean. Not only does it mean our sins are forgiven, secondly, it means we have a purpose here on earth for living. The purpose is to become more like Jesus. The purpose is to follow him. The purpose is to bring the kingdom of God to earth here in our world, in our lives. And lastly, it means that we have an eternity with you, a home in heaven with you. Lord, may these truths sink deep into the lives of every man who's responded this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.